Welcome back clinical problem solvers خیلی خوشحالیم که اومدین امروز با هم پزشکی صحبت کنیم ما کاشی ها رو داریم oh, you know it's about to be the Persian takeover <laughs> Robbie how are you let's get some let's get some Lebanese love you know there. you make English sound like such a boring dull language compared to Farsi it's unbelievable you're like I feel like your voice is so musical and melodic like, oh, Robbie how are you <laughs> <laughs> just keep going man take over <laughs> take over well we are so excited for today um because we have Kashar, who's going to be doing the teaching points. Um, Kashar, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you right now? What time is it over there? Hi, everyone. I'm Kashar, medical student from Iran. It's 7.30 in the afternoon right now here. I'm, I'm going to be doing the teaching points today. And what's your favorite Persian dish? It's a hard choice. It's really a hard choice. But if I have to choose, really, I got to go with the classics like Borma Sabzi is irreplaceable. <laughs> <laughs> got to go with the classics. When you come to L.A. and visit me, we will I'll take you to the place that has the best Borma Sabzi. You, Patty, so know that we never say um, a restaurant's Borma Sabzi is better than our mother's. But this restaurant's warm sabzi is better than my mother's. And my mom will never listen to this episode. So it's okay, Robbie. Don't get worried. <laughs> but it really is better. Like the way that <laughs> lamb just like comes off the bone. Um, all right. And then now we I got... know I can get you into trouble, Prof Raz. Now I know I can get you into deep, deep trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got Elena, who will be scribing for us. Elena, please unmute yourself. Tell us where you are. What time is it? Hi everyone, I'm Elena. I'm a medical student from Germany. It's 6 p.m. right now here and very warm. <laughs> very good. Um, well, Elena, thank you for joining us. And we have the one and only Zacharia. Zacharia, unmute yourself. Tell us where you are and what time it is. Hello everyone, I'm Zacharia. I'm, I'm, I'm a South African doing my internship in Cape Town. Uh, it's currently just after six in the evening, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting back to clinical problem solvers after a while away. And before we get into the case, like Robbie, how like incredible is this? We got someone in Iran, someone in Germany, someone in South Africa, and then two clowns in the U.S. who are immigrants. Um, just really special. And the first clown we'll discuss, who is also known as Robbie. <laughs> We can go to the whiteboard. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, can I start? No. Okay. So, uh, I. I really contemplated for a long time about whether or whether I would not present this case, but uh, I'm going to take you back to when I was a very young medical student uh, to likely the most personal and uh, impactful case I've experienced so far. Uh, the history is uh, a 22 year old male reports a history of chronic loose stools uh, about one to two times a day in the morning for the for the last eight months. He reported no history of any weight loss, night sweats, or fevers, and a systemic history was unremarkable for dysphagia, adenophagia, symptoms of acid reflux, joint pain, or rash. After these eight months, he suddenly had a period over one to two days where he developed acute severe nausea without any vomiting as well as severe generalized abdominal pain that he, would that he would describe as coming and going in waves. He was seen by a physician on the day of that abdominal pain where he was noted to have normal vitals and a normal physical exam, and he was referred to a gastroenterology clinic. At the clinic a few days later, he underwent an upper endoscopy that showed no evidence of H. pylori and a mild degree of chronic gastritis. He was given a trial of PPIs and only reported a minimal improvement in symptoms. And I'll stop there. 
Oh, Zachariah, wow, thank you for that setup. I think it's um, uh, 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 we're off to a really intriguing start. And Prophet, I think that there's sort of two elements to this case so far. There's the uh, background of chronic loose stools, which was uh, unfortunately punctuated by an acute severe episode. And maybe I'll just tackle the background of loose stools and um, pass on the mic to you thereafter. Um, you know, I think that in general, whenever you're hearing uh, um, information from a patient and getting a history, um, I try to put it into one of two very loose but and often overlapping compartments. And that is this a symptom or a piece of history that the patient is giving you that is uh, uh, falls under the category of discomfort? Or is this a piece of history or information that is the patient's giving you that falls under the category of dysfunction? And it's really, really important to try to keep track of, is this primarily an issue of comfort for the patient or has there been loss of function? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, and so I think that's the question for when patients have diarrhea or when patients have pain or when patients have nausea. Those three things are things that are inherently uncomfortable but the function of the GI tract is to allow you to remain nourished and hydrated. And so when somebody comes in and has a diarrheal episode without compromise of their nutritional status or hydration status, that is primarily an issue of comfort. Now, why is this categorization of health, uh, very, very important in general? If I tell you that I have had an uncomfortable ache in my head for five years, but have never progressed to any functional compromise of my neurological status, you'll diagnose me with a primary headache syndrome. If I tell you that I've had an ache in my chest for five years, but never compromised my exercise capacity, you'll tell me that I have nonspecific chest pain. And so I think if you approach this diarrhea from that lens of this person for, for eight months, up until that very telling day, has had a very uncomfortable experience, but had yet not lost any function that we can tell a, uh, a nutritional capacity and water restoration capacity, um, I think you would start to progress towards the um, primary diagnosis under this category, which is irritable bowel syndrome. And now that has, you have to be sure that there has been no loss of function and that the patient hasn't had any weight loss, has not developed nutritional deficiencies signaled by anemia, low vitamin D, osteoporosis, or has not um, been dehydrated enough. And that's what IBS is. IBS is that you have a uncomfortable circumstance without loss of function. And so I think the tension in this case is, is the, the background related or not? And if Zachariah had told us that this background was eight years, it would not be related. If it were eight days, it's almost certainly related. And I think eight months falls into the spectrum of uncertainty, leaning more towards the fact, leaning more towards it being unrelated um, based on the duration, but leaning more towards it being related based on the fact that the accompanying subsequent symptoms are also of gastrointestinal origin. So in stark contrast to what we did learn, if we had actually later learned that this diarrhea that this patient has had was then punctuated by a severe thoracic, neurologic, or extremity syndrome, I think the connection between them between would be weak. So to summarize, this patient has a discomfort syndrome for a long, long, long period of time without any dysfunction until that telling day. And so the key question will be, is that telling day uh, uh, part two of that story or is it unrelated? I think that's yet to be seen. Raffrez, thoughts? I love that. I've never heard you talk about dysfunction versus discomfort. Very, very wise words. And Robbie, I'm going to be very authentic here. Like if this is just one episode of nausea and abdominal pain, and there hasn't been a recurrent episode, I'm actually not going to invest much cognitive energy. All I can say is like with gastritis, the most common etiologies include alcohol, NSAIDs, H. pylori, but we don't have a pivot point yet. We really don't have anything that um, warrants 
a huge investment of time. So I'm going to pause there and ask for more data until we get a signal to, to push forward. Amazing. Uh, the second adequate will take you from, from the past making history up until the end of the, the lab results. Uh, previously, he'd been well. He, he worked as a, he was a university student with a family history of his mom having asthma and his dad having Graves disease. He had no substance use or alcohol with regards to his health related behaviors and he did not take any medication. On his physical exam, he had normal vitals and was well appearing without, without any conjunctival pallor or ictus. He had no lump adenopathy noted. His abdominal exam showed no distension or organomegaly and he had very mild tenderness on deep preparation on his epigastric region. His cardiovascular, respiratory, and neurological exams were normal, and no skin rash was noted. With regards to his labs, he had a normal urea and creatinine with a calcium mildly above the reference range. His FPC showed a white cell count of seven with a normal differential, an HB of 17.6, and platelets of 318. His liver enzyme showed an ALT of 12, AST of 15, ALP of 65, and a GGT of 15. His albumin was normal, and his CRP was 1. His iron study showed a ferritin of 63 with a percentage saturation of 42%, and his B12, folate, and iron levels were all normal. With regards to his celiac study workup, he had negative anti-tissue transglutaminase and anti-deamidated gliadin antibodies, and his IgA levels were normal. And I'll stop there. Wow. Um, you know, Zachariah is a clinical problem solver when he's giving you the IgA levels and the celiac serology. Well done, my friend. You're presenting this beautifully. And I also noticed another person entered our group named Ahmad Rabi. We have now two Rabis, so the session has just become that much more beautiful. Um, so what do we do with this information? This is a very difficult case because I'm not even sure the patient meets the diagnostic criteria of diarrhea because it's really just one to two loose bowel movements. That's unusual and abnormal, but I'm not sure it meets that uh, definition, per the formal definition. And then the episode of abdominal pain and nausea, that happened remotely. It's not currently happening. And our physical exam isn't too telling. Um, I can talk about all the negatives, but I think that would honestly not be very educational. And everyone might have some discomfort if you push hard enough in the epigastric region. But if you wanted to take an anatomical approach to abdominal pain, in that epigastric region, there's gastritis, there is GERD, there's peptic ulcer disease, and then there's a few etiologies like constipation or colitis that go throughout the entire um, abdomen. And I'll just comment on the lab because I'm really interested to see Robbie's take on this. He's able to, he's usually able to sniff stuff out of nothing. But when I look at these labs, I'm just reassured. Like the hemoglobin is a bit up. But this patient is having loose stools. Maybe they have abdominal pain. Maybe they're not drinking much fluid. So I'm not really activating a schema for polycythemia. I'm trying to see, is there any evidence of inflammation? White blood cell count is normal. Platelet is normal. The albumin is normal. I'm assuming the CRP is normal and it's not a high sensitivity CRP. Um, so Robbie, I still, I'm like actually wondering, you know, I, Wondering why the patient came to the ED. Um, maybe it's this just loose stools with no answer and this dull ache in the epigastric region, unless I missed something that Zachariah mentioned. And I'm just trying to see like everything so far is reassuring to me, but I would love to hear from your ED lens. Is there anything that jumps out? Alfred, um, oh, I, I'm enjoying this conversation so much for two reasons, one of which is just seeing how shrewd um, Zachariah is. And you can you you can tell a skilled presenter and like you're telling us 
that this is not celiac in a very subtle way by telling us the details of those testing and also the highlighting the importance of actually making it all the way into the labs at this at, at this juncture. And this is probably unfortunately a very common scenario. We talk a lot about it in patients with chest pain, but um, this is the beauty of seeing patients before they get admitted because honestly, the vast majority of patients with abdominal pain are this. And we never find out why ever. Uh, in many, many instances of abdominal pain. And I owe a lot, a lot of gratitude to the academy and the teaching sessions we've had to have uh, allowed for crystallization of what it means to have diffuse abdominal pain. And so I'll just share that and see what progress we can make together. Um, because we know for a fact that this patient was hurting everywhere. And um, you then you, you then ask yourself, gosh, it's they're hurting everywhere. What is present in the abdomen everywhere. And unfortunately, the most common, uh, the most morbid um, organ that's present everywhere is the gut. And this is why patients with diff acute mesenteric ischemia present with pain everywhere. This is why patients with bowel obstruction, which I presented at Profess a couple of times now, um, have uh, uh, present with diffuse abdominal pain. This is why patients with perforation, as uh, Debbie just wrote, um, present everywhere. So I have first asked myself when somebody presents with diffuse abdominal pain, do they have a gut problem? And the most important gut problems are the ones we love to diagnose, vascular problems, perforation problems, or obstruction problems. And those are the things that grab our attention in the moment. The I of the VIPO mnemonic of acute abdominal pain is for inflammation. And the most common cause of diffuse abdominal pain that isn't vascular perforation or obstruction is diffuse gastroenteritis. And patients come in, their belly hurts a little bit, they're nauseous and they're having diarrhea, which is very much in keeping with the kind of flavor that we have in this, in this case. Patient has diffuse abdominal pain, had diarrhea, had nausea. And so uh, I think gastroenteritis would be a very, very reasonable diagnosis to, to, uh, to render this patient, recognizing that the diarrhea isn't that profound. And then you're like, wait, but this has been going on for, for a while, if this is related to the history. Is it true, true, and unrelated? And so that's what I think is very, very helpful. I'll just share um, the visual with you all, which we don't, I don't do enough anymore. Um, but this is um, a schema that we put together really after an academy um, teaching session. And I'm sharing it with you because um, What's diffuse abdominal pain? It's diffuse in the bowel, inflammation, obstruction, ischemia, or rarely edema, or other things that are diffuse. And the other things that are found diffusely throughout the bowel are the peritoneum, as Debbie just said, the nerves, which we'll talk about last, and then things that um, per uh, permeate throughout the whole body. So in patients with DKA and their keto ketones cause diffuse abdominal pain, or patients with opiates have uh, narcotic bowel syndrome or cannabinoid hyperemesis. And so, Prof. Raz, the only reason I'm bringing the scheme up is because we learned that this patient has a slightly elevated high calcium. And so, I think the question with that calcium is, is it, sig is it significant enough to push the case forward? And I would actually be, um, in most cases, would probably ignore a mildly elevated calcium because the probability of a patient who comes in with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea having hemoconcentration and that calcium being artificially elevated is very high. And so I think in real life, I would probably um, hydrate the patient and call it a day, but I would be inclined enough to add on a PTH and I would probably leave it at that. And so I think this case is all about, is there something to sniff out or not? And I think the answer in real life would be most of the instances, the only abnormality we got the calcium is likely a result of hemoconcentration. Um, but I think with the sheer prevalence of primary hyperparathyroidism, I would um, probably hydrate the patient, add on a PTH, but I would tag it for the primary team to follow up, primary care provider to follow up. It wouldn't be something that would like, I have to figure this out before we go. Um, the one thing I would be very, very important to, for all of us to make sure is that the lipase is normal because you can easily see that a patient with diffuse abdominal pain might have pancreatitis, especially related to hypercalcemia. So what's the big learning? I think the big learning is to ask yourself, when patients come into to your care with a diffuse abdominal pain, the most important structure that we're often invoking is the bowel, bowel, bowel. And the most common diagnosis under that is diffuse infectious gastroenteritis. 
But what we try to rule out in emergent settings is ischemia of the bowel, perforation of the bowel, or obstruction of the bowel. But remember, there are three other structures found diffusely throughout the abdomen, the nerves, the peritoneum, and then a substance-induced abdominal syndrome like uh, um, uh, DKA, for example. And so I think in this instance, I probably wouldn't do much yet, uh, but excited to see what happened and what um, Zachary did. And, and Robbie, I know you're not there, of course, like you didn't physically see the patient, but your threshold to pursue imaging of the abdomen, like, you know, you're not there. So like, it's very difficult. Maybe it's not even a fair question for me to ask you, but I was curious if you can comment on that. Yeah, Prof. Rez, I think that um, I think that a threshold to pursue imaging in this patient would be very low, um, and I can explain why. Even it's actually uh, uh, it's a very small font on the schema, so I'll put it up again. I think it's a matter of question, really. If if your suspicion, you see how CT high yield if your suspicion is in low bowel, but CT is very low yield if your suspicion is some, somewhere else. So for me, I think that this patient does not have abdominal distension. Therefore, the probability of obstruction is low. Now, the patient is very young for acute mesenteric ischemia, so that would be very, very unlikely. Um, and um, I think that uh, the general tale of the story is not fully in keeping with a sinister cause of a bowel issue. So I would probably hydrate the patient. If they weren't able to eat, now you have loss of function, and I think you have a you have a much uh, almost impossible barrier before you discharge the patient. So often you get a scan just to be able to have clarity before you let somebody go who's still suffering from a loss of function. So if this patient were to be hydrated with nausea medications and felt good enough to eat and tried to eat, I probably would not scan them, but. If they um, could not did not improve with hydration and could not eat, I don't see another pathway to uh, to discharge without that scan. Thank you, Robbie. It's a real. We're very very intrigued. Just just amazing. Uh, a short aliquot. Uh, a few a few years later, the patient presented to the same cl GI clinic. This was as an outpatient. He continued to report this history of chronic loose stools, as well as daily nausea and abdominal discomfort, mostly in the mornings. He also reported that he had noted a significant pattern that whenever he would leave the city he was living in for the holidays, he noticed a marked improvement in his symptoms almost immediately. He stated that whenever he left, his diet did not change at all, and he had wondered if the symptoms could potentially be related to stress. However, when he was in the city of his studies, but in the holidays, he continued to have those same symptoms. He also noted that when the bloods had been taken previously, he'd, also, he'd been on a gluten-free diet for a few weeks already. And he said that last year he'd been seen at another clinic due to a rash that he had had from the age of 12 that had started to flare up. And I would like to now share a picture, please. And I'll stop there. Zachary, do you mind orienting us to where this is? is this the... so, so this is the back of the patient. So this see. is the upper part of the back, like the shoulder over there, and that is his, the bottom. I see. Wow, this is very, very intriguing. And do you know, is the rash uh, itchy or... Um... Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about the symptoms associated with the rash? Sure. So, uh, I, th I think it's also, uh, let me just reshare that picture while I provide the history. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, uh, that's going to be a bit difficult. Uh, one second. Oh, no problem. Take it. Yeah. Okay, so, so why, why don't I pull up that picture again? The patient noted that he had a history of severe generalized pruritus that would occur especially after exercise, showering, or any form of increased body heat. Mm -hmm. Once he started scratching, he reported this burning red skin rash that would then disappear, leaving no trace within about 30 minutes. Wow. 
Uh, gosh, yeah, this this rash is very, very striking. I mean, I think it's unfortunate to hear that the patient continues to have uh, low-grade gastro gastrointestinal symptoms. I can just comment on the rash. I think the the rash being on the on the back in areas where the patient has scratched is very suggestive of dermatographism, what's, uh, which is a phenomenon where hypersensitized mast cells in the skin are triggered to release their granules by contact. Um, what's really intriguing to me is to see that the rash is also potentially in places that the patient cannot scratch, but, I, but I'm not sure if that's true. Um, Often in the middle of the back, it's hard to reach the middle of the back, but you can see that essentially the, my reflex thoughts looking at this rash were that it seems to be an outside job because of the striking linearity of it. Uh, you can see how an external, uh, you can easily imagine an external fingerprint of something making contact with the skin in such a linear way. The differential diagnosis of this finding of such striking linearity is something called flagellate dermatitis which can occur most classically with shiitake mushroom ingestion. And so an ingestion of a specific mushroom that does this rash. I've actually seen it a couple of times in real life, uh, but it also can happen with uh, 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 chemotherapy exposures and um, some autoimmune diseases. But I think given the history that the rash comes and goes with contact, I think dermatographism uh, and therefore the, the inlet into mast cells and, and that space would probably be something that we would um, start to think about. Um, so yeah, that's where I would take this rash. I'm curious, Profraz, now that we know that this person has constant low-grade GI symptoms, I'm curious where where your head is at with that. Um, th it's really interesting, isn't it? This case, like, and it was funny after that second aliqua or third aliqua, he's like a few years later, he presented back to the GI clinic. So a lot of time um, had passed. I, this is a tough case and I'm pulling up one of my notes and I want to show that to you because I think it was either a morning report. I believe it was a, a morning report that Robbie had presented, but I just want to, Robbie, you had mentioned the word uh, dermatographism and I just wanted to share a brief illness script on it. It's usually a benign finding with no further workup that's needed. And it's the most common form of inducible urticaria. About 5% of the population has dermatographism. And literally dermatographism means right on skin. So as Robbie said, you scratch and then you get this um, urticaria on the skin. It's a rapid onset um, after stroking or scratching the skin. And usually the patient is scratching for another skin condition and then they notice this. So there's two types. There's a simple, which is without pruritus. And um, this one, if you look at it, another way to think of it, it's apruritic dermatographism. And then there is a symptomatic kind, which is often idiopathic, quicker in onset, um, and it's inflamed and swollen. And I think uh, what this comes down to is if you don't think this is benign and the simple type, then you really got to look for a secondary etiology. And what Zachariah told us was a few interesting clues on the history of water worsening the rash. Um, I think you said, Zachariah, exercise worsening the rash. And... So um, you go back and you look at the rest of the data and you said one more thing, Zachary. You also said that when they did the celiac studies, the patient was already on a gluten-free diet. Uh, so that's a really important point because you want that, those antibodies will go down. So you don't want patients altering their diet when you actually send the celiac serology. So it's gonna be really important for this patient to be on a regular diet and then you repeat the celiac test Celiac is really interesting in that it can cause all of this and it can present with extra intestinal symptoms and rash is common, but the rash is derm dermatitis or pediformis usually, but I'm sure you can get other rashes too. So I don't think celiac is prioritized, but it's on my thought enough, knowing that dermatographism 
is in 5% of the population that I would retest that for sure. Then, um, you know, the, you now got to look at the hemoglobin with a different lens. And what I mean by that is because of the water worsening the rash or the pruritus, all of a sudden myeloproliferative neoplasms become a possibility and a specific type within that group, polycythemia vera. Remember at Aliquot 1, when Zachariah presented this, I said that the hemoglobin doesn't really grab my attention because the patient's hypovolemic, a bit concentrated, but I would be very curious what the trend of the hemoglobin is. Um, it's And something else that would be really helpful is the differential. I know it's normal, but if there's any basophils, because basophils can be a clue to a myeloproliferative neoplasm if they are elevated. The hemoglobin isn't that high, but again, just something to consider with that water uh, exposure. Then if you say someone is having diarrhea, rash, um, and Robbie mentioned histamine, which is from mast cells, then you wonder, could there be systemic mastocytosis at play? Systemic mastocytosis has a characteristic pathognomonic form of urticaria, referred to as urticaria pigmentosa. Um, but this isn't, this doesn't look like that. But it's something else that's worth thinking about. In general, urticaria is benign, but if it persists, then it should prompt consideration of these more sinister etiologies. I'm going to definitely give the mic back to Robbie, but where I am, it's like I'm trying to incorporate the water exposure, the exercise exposure, and that puts me, in my dealing with the myeloproliferative neoplasm, um, specifically polycythemia vera, I'm looking at um, the fact that the patient has the loose stools, the rash, can it be systemic mastocytosis? I would look at the basophil. I would send a tryptase to get a sense of how elevated those histamine levels are. Could this be celiac and the dermatographism is just from, you know, it being a benign process? However, that wouldn't explain the water exposure, the exercise, and then the really unique clue that Zachariah shared, which is this only happens when he's in his home city. I remember when I was taking a neuroscience class in college, there was a patient who, whenever they went home, would develop polyuria, polydipsia, would come to the hospital, would be hyperglycemic, things would resolve, and then they would go home again. And it was really stress-induced. And Zachary even told us that when the patient was on vacation in their home city, they still had these symptoms. So something about the home city is a triggering factor. And it's not, it doesn't seem to be stress related. So all of a sudden, Robbie, that also prompts me to consider uh, certain exposures that the patient may have, but what exposures, like now I'm using analogical reasoning and I'm thinking of pneumonitis from someone feeding a pigeon, but this isn't that. Uh, we had a patient who was drinking alkaline water and was getting drug-induced liver injury, but this isn't that. Um, so I'm just curious, like what other thoughts do you have? And I'm just hanging on to these clues. I don't know how important they are, but really celiac disease, systemic mysocytosis, polycythemia vera, these are very rare. And I'm really having difficulty of why it only happens in the home city. Yeah, me too, Prof. I'm struggling a lot. I think that um, these kinds of cases in real life are often very, very hard to to, do, um, to get to the bottom of. And I'm very, very grateful for Zachary bringing it today. It just goes to show you that when outpatient, when medicine is evolving at an outpatient pace, our ability to diagnose it is also very, very limited and very, very tough. When patients get sick, our ability to detect what's going on with them acutely sick is much, much, much easier. And I, I'm just I'm just trying to shore things out into the things we know we have to explain. And I think that it's really interesting that in my mind, this disease has coalesced into a mucocutaneous disease um, because it's affecting the lining of the skin and the lining of the bowel. And I think that is a very, very interesting thread. And whenever my mind thinks mucocutaneous, I remind myself that the other um, organ that's involved with lining is the lungs. And so initially I was like, oh, the patient doesn't have any lung problems. But then I looked at his mom has asthma and started to wonder if that is actually part of it, if this may be her hereditary in some way, given the patient's young age and the theme of mucocutaneous diseases. And 
yeah, I think Profres for me, what the triggers did, the city, um, the showering and the exercise is they remind me, reminded me of a concept that I learned from reading about a mast cell issue a while ago about the concept of mast cell triggers, where um, you have a, a burst of mast cell activity by a sensitized IgE, but also the concept of mast cell augmenters. And um, uh, the best the best way to learn that is what spicy foods do to most people. They augment mast cell activity and they cause you to have flushing and the very similar symptoms that um, people with in intrinsic mast cell diseases have. And mast cell augmenters include increasing your body temperature, either from hot water or from showering, consuming alcohol. And so many of the triggers here seem to be in the category of mast cell augmenters. It's a stretch for me to wonder whether there is a, a pollen or exposure in the patient's city that is also falling under the category of a mast cell augmenter. And so for me, I'm entering the space like you are of ruling out celiac disease because of the intriguing dietary history, but asking myself, hey, if I had a really nice short list of chronic mast cell diseases, I bet the answer would be on here. Uh, on that list. That's where my sense is going. And so I think the most morbid chronic mast cell disease is systemic mastocytosis. And there are a variety of other ones. Some of them are genetic, some of them are poorly understood, but that's the hint that I would be um, following is mast cell, mast cell, mast cell, mucocutaneous, augmented by classic augmenters, maybe a family history of mast cell in the mom, um, so I think progress might be made by skin biopsy and seeing mast cell infiltration in the skin. But as you said, I think close scrutiny of the hematological fingerprints of this disease to look at the diff again and potentially to get a triptase to see if this is, uh, uh, if this is a uh, systemic mast cell disease as well. Very, very intriguing. Um, it's yeah. interesting too that he goes, you know, on vacation, I'm sure he showers and presumably exercises, but then he's not having, you know, the, that being said, I, I love the frame of like mast cells being the threat, threat to pursue, but it's so interesting because like dermatograph is a 5% of the population have it. Um, I don't know it, but, but those people that have it don't have the loose stools probably yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. So maybe that's why we go beyond the base right here, huh? Yeah, I mean, I think that like, could this just be IBS with a um, with dermatographism for sure? Um, I think that's very possible. I, I do think when you enter the world of reading about chronic mast cell diseases, you do realize that many patients with chronic mast cell diseases are are uh, are, are undertreated, and it's a world just like migraines that we don't really understand very well. Um, but yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to figure this out by myself. In real I'm life. glad you entered that world, Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Zachary, tell us more, please. Incredible uh, discussion so far. Uh, just a couple of things about uh, that skin disorder. He was seen by an allergy specialist at the time and diagnosed with chronic urticaria, uh, likely the cholinergic and dermatographic subtypes combined. And he reported a remarkable improvement on uh, antihistamines. He'd also had this disorder long before he moved to the city where he was studying in. Uh, he's, at the time, his celiac workup was again repeated when, while he was on a gluten diet, and it still was negative. His repeat FPC showed an HP now normal of 15 to 16 with normal platelets and a normal differential without any basophils. His calprotectin was normal, his TSH was normal, and his ANA was negative, and a repeat endoscopy was repeated. On this endoscopy, the duodenal slide showed a mild increase in intraepithelial lymphocytes that was likely within normal limits, and the gastric slide continued to show very mild chronic gastritis. The esophageal slide showed no granulomas, no ulcers, no parasites, or evidence of malignancy, but inflammatory cells comprising of lymphocytes as well as numerous eosinophils comprising up to 30 per, per high-powered field were noted, and the histological diagnosis given was eosinophilic esophagitis. And I will stop there.
the last aliquot will have quite an extended discussion and a bit more information. You know, in the interest of time, Zachariah, um, I really don't have much more to comment on here, Robbie, beyond saying that eosinophil gastro eosinophils can involve any part of the GI tract, and they're a very common cause of um, pathology, whether it's diarrhea, stricturing of the esophagus, and they are quite sensitive to uh, steroid therapy um, in, in different ways of actually delivering that steroid. But I don't really have much more to say. Maybe we can get more of the, the juice, Zachariah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, the first thing I need to, uh, to, so to sort of disclose is that we don't have a true final diagnosis, but uh, there is something I have to actually admit so the patient being discussed today and myself are actually one and the same. And there are, two, there are two parts of this. With regards to the medical point of view, uh, after the histology came out, uh, I had magnet, magnetic resonance elastography that ruled out inflammatory bowel disease and had some blood tests that showed that I had very high IgE levels. Uh, last year, I tried a short course of prednisone, which made no change at all in my symptoms and quite pointed against the diagnosis of eosinophilic gastrointer uh, gastrointestinal disease, but does not totally rule it out, with one, show one, with one study showing that even when eosinophils are eliminated, uh, the symptoms may still remain. With regards to the histology results, most of my symptoms are lower GI in nature. I, a couple of times I thought I may have had adenophagia or dysphagia, but I'm not truly convinced of that. But yet the biopsy showed such numerous eosinophils, which more than met the criteria for eosinophilic esophagitis. During the endoscopy, I know that I wasn't sedated and I was extremely nauseous. And it was a very difficult procedure that they considered terminating multiple times. And I also know that not enough samples were collected as recommended for diagnosing the disease due to the patchy nature of the surfaces effect affected. To this day, that, that pattern remains. Uh, last uh, couple of weeks ago, I left Cape Town, honestly had forgotten about this pattern uh, and wasn't really thinking about it. And I, I came back to Cape Town and within a few hours, I started having some discomfort. I, I still didn't really think about it until the symptoms worsened the next day. And then looked back on the week I'd been away from here to realize like I'd actually been totally fine. And uh, I'll stop there before I discuss a bit more about uh, more for personal reflection. I'll just jump in to say I'm I, I'm so sorry that you've been dealing with all this for such a long time. I know it seems like this predated you even studying medicine, and I think that um, um, this is the the challenge that I think healthcare has yet to rise to, which is how do we address uh long standing. Uh, a long, a long-standing complex of symptoms without a clear pivot point and a clear way to unify them together, and I think that um, in many instances, I think um, journeys like this are dismissed and not taken as seriously as they should. And I really appreciate you countering that today by sharing your very personal story in such a public space. Um, I think um, the presence of a prominent atopic phenotype here is hard to dismiss with family history and with the atopic phenotype on the skin, uh, the atopic phenotype systemically with the IgE, and the atopic phenotype in the um, uh, in the GI tract. And I think it's hard then to ignore an, uh, the uh, exposure history that you articulated where the atopy is so much more prominent um, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, environmental exposures. And so I think the core question grappling in my mind is, is this an environment uh, induced disease or is this a inherent immunological vulnerability that the environment capitalizes upon? Um, and the nuances of what, what arm of the immune system is affected is very, very intriguing because eosinophils or uh, is this an eosinophilic disease um i think is very 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 uh as a very strong hypothesis based on the biopsy finding countered with the mast cell phenotype of the pruritus 
um, and uh, dermatographism. And of course, not to mention the strong role that histamine and the cells that release the mast cells do in the creation of gastritis, which is another unusual finding in a young, otherwise healthy person. So um, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I'm not surprised, unfortunately, that there isn't diagnostic clarity. I think this is a space in medicine where it's where that those tools may not exist and our knowledge may not extend into this horizon. Um, yeah, uh, what are your thoughts, Proctor? My only thoughts is that, um, Zachary, thank you for bringing this to VMR and feeling so comfortable to share your story and that um, we'll be sending you a bill for the e consult <laughs> that Rocky and I gave you. <laughs> I'm just joking. Mike to you, Zachary. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for all the kind words. Uh, uh, after I, I realized that the skin disorder I had was a trachea, and I started thinking about this pattern, I, this honestly felt allergic in nature. So I went back to the clinic and brought up the, the diagnosis of eosinophilic gastroenteritis as a possibility to them, hence why they, they agreed to do the, the repeat endoscopy. And after I saw the histology results, I was actually elated because I felt that I had something treatable and not just an untreatable IBS sort of disease that I would just have to live with forever. And I went, uh, I, I saw the histology beforehand and I went back to the clinic expecting to be taken seriously by my doctors. But instead, I was dismissed. The, the attending told me that the pattern I had noticed meant nothing at all, and that I was overdiagnosing myself as I was a medical student. This was despite the histology showing and seemingly confirming what I had suspected. And he did not sit down and take the time to explain why he felt that I did not have the disease. And he seemed eager to elicit any other history that could pin it down to something common like NSAID use. And I walked out quite angry. So I bring this case to you today to firstly illustrate how many diseases we encounter will ultimately end up in diagnostic limbo without a true answer ever being found. But to me, this, this case highlights the importance of remaining humble and continuing to be curious. And more importantly, I bring this case to you today to emphasize the importance of listening to your patient, taking them seriously, and to never be dismissive or disparaging in your approach. Thank you. Oh, that was absolutely superb, my friend. Absolutely superb. Yeah, I think um, this one will stick with us for a long, long, long time. I think we're all hoping that you find some uh, degree of uh, comfort uh, from sharing your story and passing this wisdom on to other people. And I think that um, ultimately, while Prof. Rez was inviting the Persian crew to LA uh, for some Persian delights, I think that you probably should... Uh, come and maybe hang out in LA for a long period of time, because not only will that allow you to hang out with the one and only proper, as it might alleviate your symptoms. Um, <laughs> now, I, I honestly think I'm allergic to Cape Town. I'm, I'm naming this disease <laughs> hypersensitivity Cape Town gastroenteritis, because as soon as I get out of here, everything gets better. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I think, I think that might be the ultimate solution, my friend. I think we have a lot to gain from stealing you from Cape Town and recruiting you to hang out with us here in California. So maybe maybe this is the, the planting of that seed. Um, but yeah, thank you again. And uh, yeah, I'll be reflecting a lot on, for a long, long time on this one. Um, but we'll pass the mic to our the one of our Persian <laughs> contingency. Kasiar, the mic is yours, my friend. Um, first of all, I'm speechless. It was a case with multiple turns especially at the last part uh and okay let's start with the um, approach we had on the teaching points first uh we had a basic approach on how we see uh, patient complaints we have to distinguish between a patient discomfort and patient dysfunction in the history that they're giving us Especially in the cases of GI complaints, when there is no dysfunction, similar to this case, the time course of symptoms matter. Uh, discomfort throughout a eight-month period provides a different diagnosis than an eight-day period. At the same time, uh, when the general observation of the patient doesn't guide us to any specific direction, we have to ask, why is the patient coming here now? That may give us some clues. 
Then we moved on to a general approach to diffuse abdominal pain. First, Prophorus guided us through a, an, anatomic, an anatomic approach, and then we discussed the diffuse uh, nature of the pain, with gut being the only organ, the most important organ there that is diffusely through the abdomen. We use the VIPO mnemonic to approach the gut with vascular performation, obstruction, inflammation on our mind. We look for those symptoms. If we don't find any, we think about other organs there, nerves, peritoneum, and substances with the most important one that kind of tells us how we should think about, think about substances being the DKA, how the ketones cause the pain there. And our question here is when we go for imaging. Uh, as Robbie the Aras, uh, CTs high yield in the cases that we suspect the bowel and low yield for other parts. So we got to decide what are what is our hypothesis there. And another important clue here is if the patient can tolerate hydration, uh, uh, tolerate food after hydration. If they can't, we have to go to imaging and search for other clues. Speaking of hydration, in electrolyte abnormalities that we see in patients who may be dehydrated, we have to keep in our mind that hemoconcentration may uh, put some false flag flags for us, similar to the hypercalcemia we saw here. The results after hydrating the patient may change for us. So just we have to keep that in mind. Hydrate the patient, see what changes in the electrolytes. Uh, then the case took a turn with the skin lesions presenting themselves. We learned about dermatographism, which is a condition that a, a light scratch with COVID causes raised and inflamed lines that usually go um, disappear in less than 30 minutes. The condition is usually benign and can be uh, categorized into a prioritic dermatographism and symptomatic. In the cases of symptomatic dermatographism, we have to look for secondary causes. Or if it isn't, it isn't symptomatic, but it persists for a long time, we have to think about other causes again. Here, uh, two of the important causes that we should think about are myeloproliferative neoplasms, specifically polycytemia vera, and systemic mastocytosis, which causes a specific lesion known as Urtricaria pigmentosa. I uh, couldn't find the picture I wanted to, but too busy typing. Uh, now, with all of this in mind, another way to frame this is to look at the pathology. I was in a phyllic disease versus mast cell diseases. Uh, we learned about mast cell triggers that map out the symptoms here for us. Alcohol, warm water, spicy food, and uh, exercise can be mast cell triggers or augmentators that can trigger the symptoms with histamine release. Eosinophilic uh, diseases also, given the pathology of the case, can cause the lesions that we are seeing here. The main question at the end for us was uh, whether we should think about this disease as something that is environmentally induced or there is some other patho pathology at play. And thank you. Wow, um, Khashar, that was phenomenal. I loved your style of teaching. Um, I may even call you not a mini Reza, but maybe a big Reza, because I'm looking up to you. Mashallah, very good. And now I'm going to say, I'm very proud of you. 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 I'm very Mr. Ravi, please <laughs> conclude the session for us. Thank you. I, I, uh, I'm I glad that after trying so hard to be Dr. Ravi for 24 years that I'm denoted to Mr. Ravi after my <laughs> discussion today. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Um, big, big, big shout out to Dr. Ravi for an incredible case. Really, really appreciate it. You, uh, I, you know I'm what's so funny about that? Uh, Man, the whole world refers to me as Prof. Raz. Yes, I'm not I'm even Mr. like Ravi. academically, but everyone prefer, but then you get Ravi. Mr. I'm Mr. Ravi. <laughs> I think it's perfect. Uh, thank you, Elena, for jumping in last minute and uh, keeping up with the complex scribing of this case. And uh, um, and yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next time. Bye. Mm -hmm.